Amen. Turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2 to get us started tonight while you're turning there. For some who think, while you're making an awful big deal about doctrine, Baptists always have. Um, if we believe the Bible is the final rule of faith and practice, the Bible is made up of doctrine. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness. He warns in the next chapter, but the time will come when they will not endure <coughs> sound doctrine. Uh, in church history, we find that Baptists have been willing to go to the stake and to die for their convictions about doctrine. For instance, Baptists have always believed that once a person gets born again, they're to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. <coughs> also, since baptism is only for believers, Baptists did not baptize their babies. And even in the early days of this country, Baptists were jailed and persecuted in the colonies because they would not baptize their babies. That was doctrine. As a matter of fact, Patrick Henry, before he gave his very famous speech before the Virginia House of Commons, the day before, he saw two Baptist preachers whipped with metal whips because they would not baptize their babies. And he stood up before the Virginia House of Commons and he said, Is life so dear, or peace so sweet, as to be purchased at the bonds of slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. So Baptists have stood for liberty, but they've stood for sound doctrine. Now that doesn't mean all Baptists do that, obviously. There's a running away from, from sound doctrine as quickly as possible in a lot of Baptist churches. And although I am an independent Baptist, I'm ashamed to say it, but there are becoming more and more independent Baptist churches that are running to this horrendous heresy of Calvinism. Now, we've covered a number of things. I'll do some review. Uh, I do believe repetition is the key to learning. I want you to get this. I want you to know why we're against it, and I trust you're against it as well. Hopefully, you've heard enough already in the days that you've been coming, if you've been paying attention. And by the way, if you want to learn more, there are good books out there. I've shared the books. Uh, Hunt's book, What Love Is This?, is absolutely priceless when it comes to combating this horrible heresy. Uh, but there are other books out there as well, and we've mentioned them in the messages. I'll not do that tonight. But um, notice, beginning in verse 4 of Colossians chapter 2, it is a warning. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now I want you to notice that. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. We're going to be mentioning again where this horrible doctrine comes from in a moment. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, we have another warning. That one was by Paul. This one is by Peter, of course. Then we'll look at one by Jude. He says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now go over to the book of Jude, the book just before Revelation. It's just one chapter long. In Jude, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Calvinism is a lot like other cults. The scripture does not mean what it clearly says to the Calvinist. All scripture has got to be run through some other book. And usually it has to do with the doctrines that were taught by John Calvin. As a matter of fact, the words are changed all the time. You take, for instance, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, when he says, God is not willing that any should perish. Now, anybody who just listens to that, given by the Holy Spirit of God, for a holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, very clear, he's not willing that any should perish. But to the Calvinist, because he's got a false understanding of the sovereignty of God, says it can't mean that. It has to mean any of the elect should perish. That he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, that's very plain, but it can't mean that to the Calvinist. It must mean all the elect. You see, they have to change the words. Anytime you find any kind of cult that has to change the words of God for you to understand it, let God be true and every man a liar. Don't listen to them. They're wrong. And we find it over and over again. Calvinists say that they believe the Bible, but the reality is they only believe what is interpreted through Calvin's writings. For the Calvinist changes world to elect 20 times. It changes whosoever and all into elect at least 16 times each. So now that's another 32 times plus that 20. He changes whosoever and all into elect. I said oh, that already at least 16 times each. He turns the phrase every man into elect six times and everyone into elect three times. They are dishonest. They don't believe the Bible. They run it through Calvinism, and that's what they believe. They don't believe that God simply said what he meant, and he meant what he said. As a matter of fact, Calvinism teaches you then that Jesus was a deceiver, a deceiver at best and a liar at worst. For when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he didn't mean it. He didn't love the world. Now, I don't know about you, but I take offense at that. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They'll take verses when you share with them, for instance, in John, uh, John chapter 1 and verse 9, that Jesus, uh, let's see, let me go ahead and turn back to it. Uh, he lighteth every man that cometh into the world. They say it doesn't mean that. He doesn't light every man. He only lights the elect. When it says in John chapter 12 and verse 32, um, it, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Well, it can't mean that because all men don't come to Jesus. No, there are people that reject Jesus. That's why all men don't come to Jesus. But they want, they want that to say that anybody that does get saved, he irresistibly draws them. They cannot not be drawn for... He has to even give them life, not because of faith on their part, but he has to give them life for they can even understand the things of God. In John chapter 6 and verse 37, Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Nobody has a problem with that until they go through Calvin. Who does the Father give to Jesus? All that believe. That's simple enough. It's simple. It's very, very plain. All that believe are given to Jesus. Now, it can't mean that. It only means that God draws them all to Jesus of the elect. Can't draw anybody else. Just the elect. Because they have a false view of the sovereignty of God. He redefines, they redefine clear Bible terms. Like except a man be born again... He cannot see the kingdom of God. Now we understand a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God gives them life. He regenerates them when they by faith put their trust in Jesus Christ. Anybody reading the book of John, that's the only conclusion you can come to. It's when you read a Calvinist that says, no, no, no. What that means is since man is dead in trespasses and sins, he can't know anything. He can't understand anything. He's totally depraved and totally unable 
to believe God and to get saved. It's not possible for him to get, because he's dead. Even though the rich man was dead and in hell, and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. His body was dead, but he could still see, he could still hear, he could still feel, he could still remember. He was dead. Why is he still being able to do all these things? Now listen to me. It is the gospel of Christ that is the power of God and the salvation. The Holy Spirit of God convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And the Calvinist says, no, that's only the elect. Over and over again, clear Bible verses, they change. Now, if you fall for that, you'll fall for any cult that's out there. I want you to get that. I'm serious about this. When I say it is heresy, man, those who believe it are heretics. It is what they are. Anybody that would so brazenly change the scripture like that. All right, Calvinism, a belief system that is heresy based upon the writings of a man over Scripture. And we understand this, by the way, all Calvinists don't agree on everything about, Calvinist, about Calvinism. Now, there, is the main, there are the main tenets of Calvinism that most all of them agree with, although some claim to be two-point Calvinists, three-point Calvinists, four-point Calvinists, and some five-point Calvinists. Some claim to be seven-point Calvinists. Uh, and the truth is, as far as the five main points are, for these people to say that, uh, well, no, I don't hold to one, then they're being, being very inconsistent. It makes me wonder if they even understand what the other points really are as far as Calvinism is concerned. I do believe it, was, it is heresy. I believe those who come from a Bible-believing church like ours who change the Calvinism are apostate. I'm just making very clear statements. They have left the faith. They have left God's word. I believe that Calvinism presents a different God than the God of the Bible. Their false view of the sovereignty of God has God as an evil bully who makes men sin and then punishes man for doing what God makes them do. You see, they believe that God has decreed everything that happens. Even so much that if the typist types a T instead of a C that by mistake on the typewriter, God decreed that they would do that from the very beginning. That is a false view of sovereignty. Everything has to have already been decreed. Understand, there's a vast difference between the foreknowledge of God and the decree of God sovereignly making every man do what he does. That makes God the author of evil. In everybody's life, Hey, you don't have to take responsibility for it in your life. By the way, have you thought about this? With that kind of a view of sovereignty, what's the point in praying? There is no point in praying because if God's already decreed it's going to happen, it's going to happen whether you pray or not. Your prayers mean absolutely nothing. And everything Jesus taught about prayer in the book of John is out the window. It doesn't matter. You see what they believe. You want to, how in the world, why even go to church? God knew you'd stay home anyway, and he decreed it. So even though you know it's a good thing to go to church, what does it matter? What does it matter if you pray? What does it matter if you witness? Well, Jesus said to witness. Yeah, but even if you don't, those people will still get saved if they're the elect, and they won't get saved if they're not anyway. So what's the point? Calvinism's God does not desire to save all mankind. And Calvinism's Christ has no intention of dying for the sins of everybody on the cross. Some Calvinists would say this, to suggest that Christ came actually to save all men is universalism. But that is a lie. Universalism teaches that all men will eventually be saved, not that salvation is offered to everyone. I was sent this uh, little article today, and I thought, wow, this really fits in with this excellent Imagine a man in a barge surrounded by a thousand desperate people with no life jacket. They're in the water. They're going to die if someone doesn't rescue them. Now, this man with the barge has a barge that would hold everybody that's in the water. He has enough food and clothes and everything that's needed to save all thousand of the people that are there. 
But he decides, instead of saving a thousand, he plucks 150 from certain death, leaving the rest to drown because it pleases him to do so. Now, let me ask you a question. What would the headlines be the next day? Man who had a boat that could save the thousand people that were in the water only saved 150. Do you think that person would be lauded as a hero or as a monster? But you see, that's Calvinism. The one in the boat with enough to save everybody is God. And he, don't, he doesn't do it because he doesn't want to do it. Everyone would condemn such despicable behavior. No one with any sense of morals that God has imprinted upon every conscience could praise such a man for leaving anyone to drown whom he could have saved. Yet we're supposed to believe that God refrains from rescuing millions and perhaps billions whom he just as well could have saved. And we are to praise him all the more for having limited his love and mercy and grace. That's the teaching of Calvinism. That is an offense to the God of the Bible. Many Calvinists are extremely dishonest and deceitful when it comes to spiritual things. They'll say of themselves that they only believe the Bible, but it's a lie. They believe what John Calvin says or what other Calvinists say about the Bible. They do not believe what it clearly says because they have to run it through their Calvinism Bible translator that I had up here the other day. The five main points, total depravity, which is really total inability. I had someone say to me just the other day, uh, you mean you don't believe in total depravity? Oh, I believe the biblical term. I believe what it means from the Bible that man is dead and trespasses and sins. I do not believe that man is unable to put his faith and trust in Christ. I believe that he can. I'm going to read a couple of things to you to shock you ton tonight. Uh, but anyway, unconditional election. Some people are elected to heaven and some to hell. As we mentioned last week or a couple of weeks ago, there are some Calvinists who say, well, we don't believe anybody's elected to hell. But we do believe only those elected to heaven are going to heaven. Well, then what about the others? Oh, they're going to hell. But wait a second. But that's by God's choice, isn't that right? That they're going to hell. Well, yeah, but he doesn't elect them to hell. Because... That's an insult to anybody's intel intelligence. Limited atonement or particular atonement is that Christ only shed his blood for the elect. He didn't shed his blood for anyone else. Irresistible grace imposed upon God by, uh, for his elect only that once he puts grace upon them, they have to receive it. They automatically will take it. Once he gives it, matter of fact, once he elects them, they have to get saved. And for the Calvinist, that means that somewhere along the line in that person's life, God has to, on his own power and his own might, has to regenerate them, born again. And then he hits them with faith, and they cannot refuse the faith. They have to accept it. You had no choice in the matter, because they see that, you understand, as a work. And then the preservation of the saints is not once saved, always saved. We talked about that last week. You can go back and listen to the message on YouTube or one of our channels that we're on. Now, I want to give you some close, closing thoughts today. First of all, understand where the head of this Calvinist extreme comes from. It comes from Augustine. Augustine was one of the church fathers of the Roman Catholic Church. He's the one who began this. didn't begin with Jesus didn't begin with Paul, didn't begin with any of the writers of Scripture. Matter of fact, you have to go down a couple hundred years, uh, 300 years, before you finally get to this kind of wicked teaching. Augustine, for him being such a great Bible scholar, here are some things that he believed. He believed in infant baptism for regeneration, that infants who die unbaptized were damned, and only those that were baptized by the mother church get to go to heaven. He, he also believed the necessity of baptism for the remission of sins. That's called baptismal regeneration. He believed in purgatory. You don't find that in the scripture either. He believed salvation in the church alone through its sacraments 
and the church alone means the Roman Catholic Church. The persecution of those who reject Catholic dogmas as they killed many during the Middle Ages and even before that. He fathered the acceptance of the Apocrypha, which he admitted even the Jews had rejected, not part of Scripture. However, the Roman Catholics still today accept the Apocrypha. These are false books. They are not books of the Bible. Now, they're literature, but they're not Bible. But he, he accepted those. He, the allegorical interpretation of the Bible uh, is what he believed in, which means that the creation account doesn't have to be six literal days. It could be long epochs of time, not necessarily literal. He rejected the literal personal reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. One of the first to place the authority of tradition on the level with the Bible. In Roman Catholicism today, you have two streams of authority. Actually, you have three. You have church tradition, you have the Bible, and you have papal bulls, which to me is an amazing term. Uh, when, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, delivering a papal bull, then that becomes as good as Scripture. That comes from God. When church tradition differs from the Bible, they hold the church tradition, which is why you can have some of the idolatry that goes on there. He taught that a person could have genuine... Now listen to this. He taught that a person could have genuine regeneration genuine piety, and even genuine faith, but without membership in the Catholic Church, these would avail him nothing, and he would go to hell. Writing against the Donatist, he wrote, the Catholic Church alone is the body of Christ. Outside this body, the Holy Spirit giveth life to no one. They have not the Holy Ghost who are outside the church. Many of the heirs of the Catholic Church can be traced, to the writing of Augustine. Now, this is where all this stuff begins. Why would any Baptist with any... And why would any saved Baptist, even for a moment, consider this as possibly being biblical? Go 1,100 years down the line, and we come to Calvin. Calvin, in his 20s, leaving the Catholic Church, but still having a great respect for the church. He had a number of things he believed besides just the five points of what we call Calvinism today. Calvin dogmatically affirmed the efficacy of infant baptism to effect forgiveness of sins and entrance into the kingdom. Now, here's the thing. He taught that being baptized by a Roman Catholic priest was efficacious for eternity. The priest could even be a rank unbeliever. Didn't change the power of the baptism. And he had to maintain this to refute being baptized again. Because you see, he was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. And it was hideous to him to even think about needing to be baptized for real. That's John Calvin. Meanwhile, Calvin derided Anabaptists for opposing infant baptism... True evangelicals were persecuted and martyred by both Catholics and Protestants for being baptized by immersion after they were saved. He also promoted the air of baptismal regeneration of salvation by some secret method of regeneration without the hearing of faith. This is not a theologian I would trust anywhere. I wouldn't want him in a pulpit. I wouldn't want him teaching Sunday school anywhere. This is wicked. Now, to show you some of their dishonesty, turn over to the book of Romans chapter 9. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can get uh, Hunt's book or a number of other books that the answer to this is very, very plain, really. Uh, and I'll give you the main points. You can go through and study it if you like. You know, some of them say, well, well, let me give you a few verses to look at. But, of course, they want you to look at them through the eyes of Calvin, and then they'll tell you the secret code, tell you what it really means. But notice in Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse, uh, oh, let's see, verse 9. For this is the word of promise, at this time will I come and Sarah will have a son, shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, 
but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. It, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Now, you read that through the eyes of Calvinism, you say, oh, see right there. For the foundations of the earth, which is not what it says, but before the foundations of the earth, God hated Esau, God loved Jacob, God chose Jacob for salvation. By the way, the quote that we read here is, math, is from the book of Malachi, chapter 1. The quotation about him having hated Esau and loving Jacob. That's positive proof. Malachi, chapter 1, was written some 1,100 years after Jacob and Esau were alive. It was not stated before. It was stated 1,100 years after. Number two, the passage is not dealing with salvation. It's dealing with which people the line of Christ would come through. That states the basic error of Calvinism is confounding election and predestination with salvation, which they never are in the Bible. Number three, clearly from Malachi's passage, it is not dealing with individuals. It is dealing with nations. And there's Bible proof for that. If you go to Genesis chapter 25 and verse 23, let's go ahead and turn back there. Genesis 25 and verse 23. Rebecca is having twins. Notice, well, let me begin in verse 22. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger and the other, than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, who was the elder? Esau. Who was... Now, is this a promise for nations, the children of Esau and the children of Jacob, or is it a promise of individuals? There is no place in the life of Jacob where Esau served him. Two nations are in thy womb. God promised the line to come through Jacob. Now, Jacob did have a problem. He made a bad choice. What was his bad choice? He gave up the birthright for a mess of pottage. He counted it as nothing. Yeah, Esau, I'm sorry. Esau did that. All right. Now, the prophecy was perfectly fulfilled in the nations. By the way, ascendancy did not occur until, until uh, or did not occur during their lifetime, but later Esau never served his brother Jacob. It's talking about serving, not saving. It is dishonest to try to use this example as an example for predestination to salvation because it's not even dealing with that. Now, getting to God's sovereignty. Man, God's sovereignty, man's free will, and responsibility. Now, the reason I am reading some of these things is because I want to say them like I have them down, and I want to make sure that you get them. It's very clear. We accept the fact that God could be sovereign in all the affairs of men, and he could decree every minute detail of man's life. I mean, he's God. He's all-powerful. He could do that if he wanted to. That God could do so is not even debatable. He's God. However, we believe that God, in his sovereignty, purposely limited himself in that he gave man a free will. This in no way discredits or dishonors the sovereignty of God. You read some of these Calvinist men, and they think that if man can make a free decision about anything, then God's been knocked off the throne. But God created us with a free will. Why? God wanted people to love him because they wanted to love him. What joy would you get out of, for instance, putting a message in your computer, and it can only say one thing, I love you. 
Would you feel loved? You put it in the computer. It's there. Nobody's telling you they love you because they love you. They're telling you, the computer's telling you it loves you because it has no choice. They think somehow this destroys the sovereignty of God, and it doesn't. We believe that God knows and knew before the foundation of the world every decision that man would make and every detail of man's life. We do not accept the teaching that says God decreed all of those decisions and details and actions. Now, I want you to get the thinking here. Get the line of thought. Understand it. If God's sovereignty extends past the free will of man, or if it is said that man's free will always acts in harmony with God's sovereign decrees, then the so-called sovereign decrees of God carried out in the daily life of man are in continual conflict with God's word, God's nature, God's character, and God's holiness. It would present thousands of theological problems which are unacceptable in the light of the word of God. Man fulfilling God's preordained decrees would create a mechanical existence which would leave no room for real human responsibility or accountability or grounds for the righteous judgment of God. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples here of what I'm saying. In Exodus 20 and verse 34, God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Now that's plain. You, you know that verse. Uh, could the same God that said what I just read, uh, could he be charged with decreeing before the foundation of the world that the Israelites under the guidance of Aaron, would, with an engraving tool, make a molten calf of gold and declare, These be thy gods. And then in verse 7, God said, Thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now, how could he say that if God made them do it? God, dec God gave, here's the holy decree of God, and now the holy God makes them sin. Even in the book of James, he tells us God doesn't tempt anybody with sin. But the Calvinists go beyond that. God makes them sin. And then God judges them for the sin he makes them do. To teach that God commanded one thing and decreed that people would do the opposite is totally inconsistent it is unacceptable, and it is blasphemous. This is the worst kind of heresy. There are millions of people who have other gods today. Can God be blamed with decreeing that men would have no other gods when he previously commanded them not to have other gods? In Exodus 20, 14, God says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. To teach that King David, by the decree of God, along with many men, some of them preachers, would commit adultery is blasphemy. I mean, Calvinism, its idea of sovereignty means that God made David do it. Is that the God you worship? It's not the God of the Bible. This is horrific. This reminds me of the story of the emperor's new clothes. They think that God specially enlightened them to see what nobody else can see. I'm sorry. They're naked. This can't be true. This would make God a horrible God, a sinful God. The same God who said, I am holy, cannot be charged with decreeing David's sin, nor the sins of whomever. That type of theology is an attack on the character and the holiness of God. Hebrews 13, 8 declares, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Malachi chapter uh, 3 and verse 6, the Bible says, For I am the Lord, I change not. God is never inconsistent. He's definitely not schizophrenic. He never lays aside his holiness for anything. Man has a free will and acts independently of God's sovereignty, not knowledge. 
because God decreed and granted that man would have that privilege of making his own decisions. And he is responsible for the decision. When I say he, I'm talking about man. Man is responsible for the decisions that he makes. For years, I prayed for my dad to get saved. Now, one day it hit me. You know, God wanted my dad saved more than I wanted my dad saved. Now, the Calvinists don't believe that. The Calvinists believe God always wanted my dad to go to hell. How do you feel about that? God, just decree, my dad go to hell. And other people that we think of as worse people, God decreed they're going to heaven. Ah, I had trouble with that. But here's the thing. I realized that the only reason my dad wasn't going to heaven was because he wouldn't take Christ as Savior. And so I can say, I can pray and pray and say, God save my dad. God save my dad. Well, he's waiting to save my dad. All my dad had to do was just turn to him and trust him. And God would save him like that. But he didn't. I can't be mad at God for my dad ending up in hell. How could I be mad at God about that? God put his son on the cross to die for him. Calvinism doesn't believe that. Jesus shed his blood for my dad, but my dad died lost because he wouldn't accept the free pardon, the free gift of eternal life. That's not on God. I could understand people believing in Calvinism, hating God for what it teaches about God, if you believe the wickedness that they teach. Well, if we accept the teaching that God is sovereign in all things, we must stop being hard on people who commit adultery. They can simply say, I could not help myself. Or as Flip Wilson used to say, God made, the devil made me do it, but the devil doesn't make you do it either. That's your own choice. God had already decreed, they could say God had already decreed that I commit adultery. And by the way, there are some that have tried that. We must stop preaching against all sin if we believe that God is 100% sovereign in the affairs of man and has decreed all things. But what's the point? I mean, what's the point of any of this? If God decreed everything happened like it's going to happen, then it's going to happen no matter what I preach, no matter what I say, no matter what I do, God's already decreed it. Why go soul winning? People get saved. Well, God said to go soul winning. Why? There is no consistency in Calvinism whatsoever. To teach that God decreed all the sins that mankind is committing is not only unacceptable, but it constitutes blasphemy. We believe that God foreknows the dotting of the t, a dotting of the i's and crossing of the t's, but we do not believe that he decreed all the dotting and the crossing. We believe that God is sovereign and could have decreed all things, but chose not to do so. We believe he chose, and I've got this in red on my paper because I want to make sure you get the emphasis here, and you can't see the red, so I'll show you red right there. We believe he chose in his sovereignty to give man a free will, Therefore, we believe that man has a free will, which God draws, enlightens, attracts, convicts, impresses, but does not dominate. And man is totally responsible for his actions, his sins, his thoughts, his words, and all that he does. We do not believe that the sovereignty of God and the free will of man and and responsibility of man are two doctrines in the word of God which cannot be reconciled by our finite minds, but simply are to be accepted. We believe in the free will and responsibility of man. We believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe that God in his sovereignty limited his sovereignty and gave man a free will and made him responsible. And the plain language of scripture makes that plain. Therefore, my position as a pastor is this, and this would be the position until I'm no longer pastor here, hopefully long beyond this. But if we find out that we have one missionary, one staff member, or a deacon, or a Sunday school teacher who holds to this blasphemous heresy, they would be fired immediately. 
They would not get another dime from us. They wouldn't be allowed to teach a children's class. It is a horrible doctrine. 2 Peter 2.1 But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Romans 3.4 declares, Let God be true, and every man a liar. I got this just today. Just came in the mail today. God's timing is amazing. By the way, this is my stand no matter who turns Calvinist. I don't care if it's a family member or a close friend. This is my stand. Let God be true and every man a liar. This letter that I got today, I need it. It's from a person. I, couldn't, I could not remember the person. I didn't remember the name. I think I do now. Uh, They attended here back in 2006 to 2011. They were not members. This person was not a member of the church at that time. Um, And this person gives uh, a little indication about the family. Her, Her father's family had always been in the holiness church. She grew up watching those people go down to the church altar and beg for God to grant them with the Holy Ghost. And after begging for the Holy Spirit for hours, these people would get up in tears because they didn't speak in tongues. Now, this is her letter, and I'm not going to give her name or where she lives or anything like that in this. She says, I thought, if this is how cruel God is, and I don't want any part of this, I turned away from anything pertaining to God. I wanted to only answer to myself and no one else. I have made a lot of mistakes in my life, and I'm sure I still have more to come, but I made a mistake that ended up coming full circle. I had an abortion when I was 18. I only bring this up because this topic is how you and God started working on me. I started visiting Madison Baptist Church with my in-laws in 2006 to 2011. It seemed like every time I came, you were preaching about abortion. I started to feel angry that I had to listen to a service filled with judgment from a complete stranger. I didn't realize that what I was feeling wasn't anger. It was conviction for my choices. I was so lost that I didn't even know know what conviction was at that time. In 2011, I came to a Sunday service and all I could think was, here we go again. You stepped up to the podium and even though I don't recall the verse you said that day, I do remember... The person you spoke about, Jesus Christ. It was the first time I'd ever heard about Jesus being the only way for us to have salvation. I, like so many others, and you, if I remember correctly. um, By the way, the reason this person's writing this started out about uh, wanting me to have a good 50th anniversary of being saved. um, And I probably should have given you that background. Because that's why this person's writing. Anyway, when I heard you convey God's words, it changed my life and saved my soul. Gave me a placement in heaven. I wanted to know more about Jesus and understand what I'd been missing out on and longing for. I asked my in-laws about God, Jesus, and salvation. I took notes at every service. It was all starting to make sense. God had been working on me for a long time. I was amazed at how God used you so that I would hear his words. On September 1st, 2011, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was baptized at Madison Baptist Church the following Sunday. All the glory goes to God, but I also wanted to tell you, thank you, thank you for staying strong, never straying from being a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching pastor. Never change your beliefs or stand, never change your stand, Uh, straying from being, let's see, because you brought God and the Bible into my life and I am sure many others. Praise the Lord for your 50 years of salvation. And she says, if you're still around at my 50 years of salvation, I'll write you another letter. (laughs) Not going to happen. But I can look back at literally the thousands that have been saved in our vacation Bible schools, thousands of young people that have been saved through the bus ministry, over the years, drunkards that have been saved. I remember preaching a message one Sunday morning and there was a young lady uh, seated about halfway back right over here 
she was visiting for the first time. She looked to me like she was probably about 14 years of age. And I preached a message on God's love for the lost. At the end of the message, she came forward, taken to the back. She got saved. Here's the amazing thing. She was a stripper over here at Jimmy's. And she found out that God loved her and Jesus died for her. If Calvinism's true, we never could have told her that. What we've been covering for the last seven services that we've gone through this, this is really serious stuff. Let God be true and every man a liar. Eternity hangs in the balance. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus. I do pray, Father, that you'll help us to be grounded, that we not be blown about by every wind of doctrine or because somebody thinks they're a theologian that has seen something that nobody else has seen but John Calvin and the few that followed him. Dear God, please help us to stand firm on the truth of your word. May we not compromise. May we stick with your book, stick with, stick with the truths from the word of God. Have your way in our hearts and lives. Bless us in the days ahead through the soul winning, through the passing out of tracks, through the bus ministry. God, give us souls this Christmas for Jesus, I pray. For we ask it all in Jesus' name.